So we're going to start on Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, again, is just uh, kind of an unusual uh, book. Um, I, we've talked about wisdom, and we've talked about King Solomon and how wise he was. Uh, he got it. He was in charge, you know, of building the temple and and that he not only built a temple, he built a castle for himself. Now, you might want to question uh, a little bit about his wisdom when I tell you that he had 700 wives. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, he, his weakness, and you're going to see it, not, in, not today, but we're going to have a, uh, a chapter which is pretty much going to be focused on sex. And uh, that was his weakness, and especially not only with sex, it was with, with foreign ladies. And so uh, I'll get into I, I uh -huh. got, and, and studied that a little bit for you. Uh, so uh, when we come to that, we're going to have an exciting day, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, besides 700 wives, you also had 200 turbines. <laughs> um, Occupines. Yeah. Concubine. You know what? A, you, anybody know what a definition of the concubine is? Just a. Isn't it just kind of a prostitute, <laughs> basically? There you Mistress, go. You yeah. Come yeah. right out and say it. He, those are. They were only in the castle for him for that only. They were prostitutes. It was like, hey, you know, Jolene, come on in tonight. I'm gonna. You're my. You're my huh. So. Uh, so, and all, and which kind of ruins it a little bit when you start reading all this, you start thinking, well, I wonder how wise he really was, but uh, he, it was true. He had more wives than any other king ever or since. Oh, uh, he, he put the Mormons to shame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's Mike. I'm fine. I got my password screwed up. I'm okay. Morning. Good morning, morning, Mike. Good morning. I, we were just morning. talking about uh, King uh, Solomon's 700 wives, Mike. Oh, great. I'm taking care of one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, God we, bless. Kind of question. We'll, we got a whole uh, lesson on this coming up, so I'm not going to ruin it right now. But I'm going to pay attention. Questioning his wisdom a little bit. When we, every week I start with, he was one of the wisest kings ever, but Having 700 wives, we're not real sure that how wise he was. So, but <laughs> all right, your warm up questions. What collectible item do you treasure the most? Oh, collectible item. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it can be anything. It's worth something to you. It may not be worth anything to anyone else, but you, you, it's, you know, you're never going to let it go. So I did no. a fundraiser for so the kids in Romania. And uh, so I was working, uh, supporting them um, as they were starting to add services for children in, in that country. But what was the best gift is when I came down, this little girl, she was, I think, 10, 9 or 10 years old. She painted a painting for me. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. And uh, I liked it so much. I uh, it's now on my wall, but I put her name, the date, and that's one of my prized possessions because she gave from her heart. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That was such a neat, neat thing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with, I'm with you, Raw. My grandkids, when they make me something, you know, that's, that's amazing. In fact, uh, my oldest granddaughter is somewhat of an artist. And so she took a slab of wood from uh, their home and uh, put a Bible, a, 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 like a scene, outdoor scene on there, and a Bible verse. And it's cool. I'd show you now, but it's behind me. But it's it's really neat. I'll never get rid of that. Yeah, I know I, when, I wish it would be, I don't know why I did with it now, but it was like our um, state championship um, medal we got for cross country for be state champions. <laughs> That's been true. Oh. In high school, so. Yeah. yeah. It would seem like an easy that? one to answer. Mike, go ahead. I said it would seem like an easy one to answer, but uh, I can't just whip right out what I uh, would treasure most. It's kind of strange. Well, if you saw 
my two storage bins, I'd have to really spend all day telling you what I can't get rid of. So yeah. <laughs> that bought it. it. I I sit more I'm in that same area, I guess. Yeah. The one thing that popped into my mind immediately, and it's it's uh, uh sentimental more than anything, but in 1946, when I was born, I had an uncle that was 13 years old at the time who bought me a, a metal car. It's actually worth today. I had it raised, uh, oh, about two years ago. It's worth about $2,000 now. <clears throat> but And I'm sure he paid like maybe a dollar. But it's a... Uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's a, a metal car and it's got rubber, mm. real rubber tires on it. And it had the wood on the side of the car, like the old woodies. And then it had a top, top that would slide down back into the uh, trunk <laughs> level area, area so you could raise it up and down. Now, oh, I, okay. I know I played with it, but it really, it, it's in really, really good condition. And, you know, and I didn't know, you know, I had that, that car for ever and ever and ever and ever. And, uh, thankfully you know i've always kept it and i didn't know that much about it and then one day i did ask my mother before she passed i said you know where did this car from come from did was it you know salvation army or somewhere and she said no your uncle rod gave you that and i said what yeah she said when you were born you know everybody was given you uh, get he gave you that car and i went oh my gosh 1946 who dot was the name you know you got Tonka, you got all these other well, then you had a company called UDOT, and uh, it's a new dot car. So I, I actually got it appraised down. And there's a guy that collects toys, antique toys in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I went to his place and went to his warehouse, and he showed me, oh, he had just thousands of things, and little pedal cars and the whole thing. And uh, But he said, well, he said, I'd give you 1500 bucks for it right now. And that was like, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And I just, yeah. I looked it up on a couple of things on, it's now up to around two grand, but I'll never get rid of it. You know, it's, yeah. I always have. Yeah, I had a neat baseball card once I had, but I can't find it out. But the baseball card I had, it had this, it's the same, it was my name, the same name as my name. He played yeah. baseball. He was a pitcher for Chicago Cubs. Said that, I saw that cool. was his nickname, or his real name, real name. Like Mazuya, something like that. Guys, ready was Jewish, no, but <laughs> but uh -huh. actually, it was the same name as mine, though. In a way, it was the same name. Mine. That's, That's cool. why I wish I had that baseball card. I said, "Oh, here's me." <laughs> it wasn't me, but it's that guy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, it's fortunate. I've got I've got a basketball signed by Michael Jordan. Uh, mm -hmm. Just happened when he came. They played the Pacers in. Uh, Indianapolis once and I hung around after the game and he come walking out and, and I had a basketball with my son and I said would you mind signing that and you know I thought he'd say no <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of times they do because they think you're going to sell it but he signed yeah. it and he, he signed it and he handed it to Jared my son and I said okay that's that's good and then also this is kind of a neat story I wrote a letter to Roger Staubach several years ago yeah after they won the Super Bowl. And I just told him how proud I was that he served he served his country and and he did all the things. I told him about my dad being a veteran in World War II. And in a in a glass box, it came in this big package. I didn't ask for it or anything. It, I get a package in the mail and I noticed up in this at this return mail, it's Roger Staubach. I thought, oh my gosh, what did he send me? Well, I opened it up and it That's was true. the uh, Super Bowl football signed to Gary from Roger Staubach. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So mm. I still have that, too. And, and wow. that Pretty one. good. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I'm feeling like I don't have anything. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to think about what I have as far as uh, oh something that I, would, that I would treasure as far as an, a material thing, and it's really yeah. not. Yeah. Not a whole That's... heck of a lot. You're I'm probably better off than all of us, then. <laughs> well, I just... <laughs> I through the years and moving and, and stuff like right now, I would say I'm <laughs> minimalist. But there's there's got to be some things that I have that I just won't get rid of, you know. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I think everybody does somewhere. <laughs> All right, the next one. What do you keep that your spouse would rather you throw it away or out? Well, now I'm stuck mm. too because I don't have a spouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Well, how long, how long were you married? Uh, I was married only for three years. There you go. Within three years, did you have anything they would like? To <laughs> oh, I would say everything. I mean, <laughs> oh, you know what? My guns. I do value my guns quite a bit. There you go. That, uh, I mean, I, go. I, I, they're still with me. I've never gotten rid of them. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There was a time those were all thrown out in the garage. So yeah, I would say. Uh, but as far as what she'd wanted me, I had this, I had this pickup truck that I really liked and she hated it. And now it's my son's. We redid it all. And it's his, it's a 68 cool. four, but yeah. Cool. Wow. Anybody mine, would, mine, mine would be paint equipment. I have some paint equipment. My wife says to get rid of it. It's r ridiculous to keep it, but I'm having a tough time, but that's what's that's what stands out right now. Mm -hmm. Kind of crazy, but that's about it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mine yeah. is a little weird. Mine, I mean, it's not weird, but it's, uh, I've probably been an educator all my life and the age that I am, I probably have close to 500 books or more. Mm -hmm. And Debbie's always saying, you're never going to read those again. Why don't you throw them away? And every time I start looking like, or I box them up and I go, okay, I'm going to do it. Well, I actually got rid of about <laughs> 250 of them. Wow. And then I, I had another 250. So I was back to about 500. But anyway, <laughs> wow. I, I took them to the local Elkhorn library, public library. And she told me they hmm. only take like 50 at a time. And, nah, nah, nah. and I said, well, I got them all in the back of my truck. And she said, well, let me go out and pick the 50. And she went out and she looked from back of my truck and she said, could you hold on a minute? And I went, sure. So she, it was a nice day. I'm standing there and she goes in the building. She comes back out and goes, and she has this big trolley cart thing. And she looked at me and she says, we're going to take them all. I went, what? She said, I thought only you only take like 50. And she said, no, no, we're taking them all. So <laughs> Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. Uh, but my books, yeah, that's probably mm -hmm. the main thing. Although she does not want me to get rid of my, I have two U Ulysses S. Grant books. His very mm -hmm. first book, it's signed uh, with his signature, and he was handing them out when they had their book deal at a bookstore in New York City. So uh, it's been signed. And I, I ended up with those because I had a lady that in Red Oak, Iowa, that knew I loved books, and when she passed, I did I, all I did was help her put coal in her in her big old pot belly downstairs for her house for heat. And I did that for her for I think 50 cents a week, something like that. But when she died, she had a she had a mansion. And when she died, she had a library in that mansion. She gave mm. every book she had to me. Mm. Some, some of them were, honestly were just ridiculous. But so mm -hmm. but yeah. Two of them I pulled off her shelf were signed by Ulysses S. Grant to her. So oh, I've kept them. Uh, I've got those. That's really Crazy. cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. Nobody, yeah. anybody else? Marv, you haven't said anything. Your wife did. She, yeah. I know she wants to throw you out. That's um, I was going to say <laughs> me. It would be the. You know, my <laughs> wife uh, is more sentimental than me. A number of years ago, we had a sale, and I had a bunch of stuff for my mother and my grandmother, and my kids didn't want the stuff, and I really didn't have much of an attraction to some of it, some of it, but we had a garage sale, and we made a ton of money on that, so that, that kind yeah. of eases, eases the pain there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. Last week we were going to do this at the end and I didn't get it done because we ran out of time. So, but I'm going to show it at the beginning. It is a summary of the whole book of Proverbs, which kind of gives you a nice introduction because we're going to, we're going to dig deeper in each one of these chapters as we go, but I'm going to show it to you. I think it's like a little over 10 minutes, so it'll be a little while, but it's good. Here, so here we go. The book of Proverbs. The word proverb typically refers to a short, clever saying that offers some kind of wisdom, and this book has a lot of those. But they're almost all in the center mm -hmm. section of the book, chapters 10 to 29. But there is way more going on in the book of Proverbs, especially at the beginning, chapters 1 through 9, and the conclusion, chapters 30 and 31. 
The book's been designed with an introduction, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and it first of all links this book to King Solomon. Now remember the story in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon had asked God for wisdom to lead Israel well. And so Solomon became known as the wisest man in the ancient world. And we're told in 1 Kings chapter 4 that he wrote thousands of proverbs and poems and collected knowledge about plants and animals. So Solomon was like the fountainhead of Israel's wisdom literature. So while not all the material in this book is written by him personally, he is where Israel's wisdom tradition began. The introduction says that by reading this book, you too can gain wisdom. Now wisdom for most of us means knowledge, but the Hebrew word chokhmah means much more than just mental activity. It refers to action also. So think skill or applied knowledge. This is why back in the book of Exodus chapter 31, it was artists and craftsmen in Israel who were said to have chokhmah. So the purpose of this book is to help you develop a set of practical skills for living well in God's world. And this gets linked with another key idea in the introduction, the fear of the Lord. Now fear here is not about terror. It's about a healthy sense of reverence and awe for God and about my place in the universe. It's a moral mindset that recognizes I am not God and that I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil and right and wrong. Rather, I need to humble myself before God and embrace God's definition of right and wrong, <coughs> even when that's inconvenient for me. Now this introduction leads us into the first main section of the book, chapters 1 through 9, which also doesn't contain short one-liner proverbs. Rather, what we find here are 10 speeches from a father to a son about how the son should listen to wisdom and cultivate the fear of the Lord and live accordingly, which means a life of virtue and integrity and generosity, all of which lead to success and peace. And the father warns his son also about folly and evil and stupid decisions that will breed selfishness and pride, all leading to ruin and shame. And so the son should make the pursuit of wisdom and the fear of the Lord his highest goal in life. And this way of thinking, it forms the moral logic of this entire book. Now these speeches from the father also clue us into what biblical wisdom literature is and how it's different from other parts of the Bible. These books explore how to live well in God's world, but wisdom is not the same as law, like what Moses gave Israel at Mount Sinai. And it's not the same as prophecy, divine speech to God's people. Rather, wisdom literature has the accumulated <coughs> insight of God's people through the generations about how to live in a way that honors God and others. And so, through the book of Proverbs now, these human words about wisdom have been put together as God's word and wisdom to his people, which connects to the other thing you find in chapters 1 through 9. There are four poems from Lady Wisdom. <coughs> Here, wisdom has been poetically personified as a woman who calls out to humanity to pay attention and to seek her. Wisdom says that she is woven into the fabric of the universe, and so wherever you see people make Making wise decisions, they are relying on her. So you see someone being generous or having sexual integrity or upholding justice. They are drawing on wisdom. These Lady Wisdom poems, they're a creative, poetic way of exploring this idea that we live in God's moral universe and that goodness and justice are objective realities that we ignore to our own peril. And so fearing the Lord, living wisely, it's living along the grain of the universe. Now together, these two sets of speeches from the Father and Lady Wisdom, they make a powerful claim about this book, that you're not simply <coughs> reading good advice, you're reading God's own invitation to learn wisdom from previous generations. And so in the next section of the book, chapters 10 through 29, we find hundreds of ancient proverbs, and they apply wisdom and the fear of the Lord to every life topic you could imagine. Family, work, neighborhood, friendship, sex, marriage, money, anger, forgiveness, alcohol, debt, everything. And these are all filtered through the value system of Proverbs 1 through 9. Now these Proverbs, they're all pretty short. They're easy to memorize. And actually this section of the book is meant to become a reference work that you return to time and time again throughout the years, which raises some important issues in learning how to read these Proverbs. First of all, Proverbs are by nature about probabilities. So you fear the Lord and you make wise, good choices. 
things will likely go well for you. And if you don't fear the Lord, you're foolish, your life will likely not go so well. Now, that is all often true, but not always. Which leads to the next point, that Proverbs are not promises. They're not formulas for success. So, some Proverbs, for example. The fear of the Lord prolongs your life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Or, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't turn from it. So yes, fearing God, being a moral person, will most likely lead to a better, longer life, and raising your kids in a stable, loving home does set them up well, but there are no guarantees. Lots of things can and often do go wrong in our world. And so lastly, Proverbs by nature focus on the general rule, but not the exceptions, which are many. And the wisdom books actually aren't ignorant of that. The exceptions are what the other wisdom books, Job and Ecclesiastes, are all about. And together these acknowledge that life is too complex for simple formulas, which is why we need all of the wisdom books together to get the bigger picture. This all leads to the final section of the book, two large collections of poems. First, poems from a man named Agur, who begins by acknowledging <coughs> his own ignorance and folly and his great need for God's wisdom. And then Agur discovers that divine wisdom has been given to him in the scriptures, which teach him how to live well. And so Agur is put before us as like a model reader of the book of Proverbs, somebody who's always open to hearing God's wisdom through the scriptures. The final poems are connected to a man named Lemuel. He's a non-Israelite king, and he passes on the wisdom that was given to him by his mom. It's guidance for being a wise and just leader. And then the final poem is an acrostic or an alphabet poem where each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the entire poem is about the woman of noble character. It depicts a woman who lives according to the wisdom of Proverbs and stands like a model of someone who takes God's wisdom and then translates it into practical decisions in everyday life, at work or at home, in her family and in her community. So the book opened with words from a father to a son about listening to Lady Wisdom, and so now the book closes by offering the words of a mother to her son about a woman who lives wisely. The book of Proverbs is for every person in every season of life. It's a guide for living wisely and well in God's good world, and that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. So what comes to mind when you hear the summary of Proverbs? It's to me, uh, by the way, it's like flashcards. Uh, you know, it, there's so much more. You hold up a flashcard and you can talk about what's on it, if you know what it means, for quite a yeah. while. So mm -hmm. Proverbs really resemble God's way with uh, Solomon of creating flashcards. Yeah. And yeah. So what's your feeling? How about, it, go ahead. To, to me, it seems like a, uh, there's no doubt the wisdom is the key thing here. But do you get from this, like, uh, your decisions that you make in life, um, very critical, and uh, there's no guarantee that everything will uh, turn out right as far as how you live your life, too. It, uh, but this is what you should pursue in the following of uh God and uh but there's just no guarantee but uh it's quite interesting this covers this has a lot in it it's got everything yeah you bet before we finish we're gonna you know we're like i said last week this is like you know a movie it's sex and violence and everything in this thing so mm -hmm. um what do you think about this comes up several times throughout and if we rewatch it you noticed it i noticed it the second third time i saw it but fear do you have anybody that you love, but you fear? No, I feared my dad when I was a kid, but I loved him. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Excellent point. Yeah. So you loved your dad, but you feared your dad. Yep, I, for sure, in my case. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there might have been some fear for the wrong reasons, but yeah, but uh, there was definitely an authentic fear, you know, of discipline as well. That was the right things, you know. 
Let me see if I'm right when I say that some of your fear wasn't the fact that it wasn't a, a physical fear, but it was a fear that you didn't meet the expectations of what your father had set before you. And if no. you didn't meet them, you were worried about the punishments that would come along with not meeting the expectations of your father. Or no. even into a way of disappointment as well, you know? Yeah. yeah. The disappointments or the fears of the, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sure. I, I think in Proverbs where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom is something that I've meditated a lot of time, a lot of years on, because it's, you know, what does that really mean? Yeah, it, I kind of interpret it as respect. Uh, yeah, in terms of because you know, even though I don't know that I feared my dad, I respected him for guiding us and and we knew when we did something wrong uh, <clears throat> but we we definitely knew it was wait till your father gets home so we better make the right choices otherwise we're going to get disciplined <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'll never forget my uh what my child both of my kids especially my daughter said to me because she struggled in her teen years and my ex-wife was not very good uh, she would yell and scream and, and things and and my daughter says, Dad, you discipline us. My mom punishes us. And there's a, yeah. big, wow. there was a big difference. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, write, yeah. write that down. <laughs> there, it was an interesting situation last night. And I did it on purpose, but I brought it up at our group. I said, okay, I brought up this thing about fear and God and that kind of thing. And, and then their father. You know what I got? Around the table. I didn't have a father. Yeah. 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 I was, yep. if you remember Marv, that was like, okay, that's why we talk about this because you are going to be a father or you are a father already. And how do you break that cycle? And yeah, exactly mentioned is true. You're, it, it's not a, a, the way that you normally think of fear. It, it's the reverence you have, the respect <laughs> that you have for, uh, that now um i find some of this also with my parents growing up as a christian is that sometimes my parents was you know i would maybe make a statement about somebody and mm -hmm. which wasn't kind and they would say to me you have to respect the position that he's in and who they are and they, there was much more of that going on in their day <laughs> than there is today i mean mm -hmm. Uh, we don't care what your title is or who you are. Uh, there's not much respect or reverence for that and who you are, even though when the apostle Paul tells you to respect those people, but anything else about this? It's a great book. Uh, I love the, the lady wisdom part of it all too. <laughs> I think like I br brought up last week, as far as who she is and, and, uh, you know, how she calls us her children as well. And she's, she's woven throughout, you know, all of God's creation is pretty fascinating to me, I think. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we were all created in God's image. And, you know, he, he took Adam, made him out of dirt and he took part of Adam and made a, made a woman. So. Yeah. There's, there's something yeah. there. Yeah. So. <laughs> So moral benefits of the wisdom of what we've been looking at. And, you know, I, I, I really started digging in how these are po poetic and how the words are used and how they, they relate back to each other. So when we look at verse one, my son, if, if, very important word, you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if, if again, you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then that's the, the outcome. You have a beginning, a middle, and an outcome. Well, understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So in verse one, if is huge. And as you start to read these verses throughout Proverbs, you're going to see that Solomon is brilliant at doing these kinds of things. And then 
you'd have like one, two, three, and then you'd have the outcome. Receiving the word uh, is the commandments and it is the treasure. The treasure is the commandments. Words and commandments are wisdom. Comments. Yep. True. I'm true. If you notice in the commandments, there's uh, yes. kind of woven into what he's talking about here in Proverbs is really substantiating the commandments. Yep. Breaking it down, conditional statements. What's a conditional statement? That's why if you do this and do this, <coughs> what will happen? Then versus now. The results are conditional, you know. It's pretty well spelled out for us if we of what we if we would do something, uh, what would be the outcome? And then and keep in mind, Solomon is long before the Messiah, <laughs> so uh, his his direction is kind of well. Yeah, this is what happens if you do do this. This is what happens if you don't do this. Uh, but Jesus really changes all that, which we won't get in today. But that that is a big difference. Solomon requires what is in verse four. What's in verse four? Hidden treasure? What's yeah, that? if you look for it as for silver, search for it as for hidden treasure. So you're looking for what? Like treasure. Wisdom. Right, wisdom. And wisdom is under understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is understanding. So... Mm -hmm. So raise your voice and be public and don't be afraid to do that. Without, if some people are being stupid, it's your opportunity to rise and shine. So with, with all the commentary, it's saying in Proverbs, you need to communicate those Proverbs, not verse by verse or word for word, but uh, how you're feeling and, and working with that. So, uh, we can see that in Proverbs in itself. And you can imagine he wrote a thousand of them and they only 500 made it into the, the Bible itself. Many of the uh, people that I've been reading in commentaries use Proverbs as a devotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Some people read one once a day, day because 31 days in a month. So they read their right. So you run and you read those and go through. And I found that a lot of the uh, re religious leaders, worship leaders in the country use bar, uh, you know, along with a lot of other things. That's not the only thing they use, but they use Proverbs as a devotional. So we work and we seek. That is where he basically is wanting us to go is for when we work. We seek the word of God. <clears throat> so don't get lost in the details. Then yeah. you will understand what is right and just and fair. Every path for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be ple pleasant to your soul. <clears throat> you know, I got to, I got to interject that. This is, no, exactly... I, I, that's, I was going to stop there. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Well, this is in my way of thinking exactly what happened uh, when we were, uh, having coffee last night at Perkins. You know, we're talking among ourselves, not ashamed of, uh, of uh, talking about our beliefs and, and thoughts and, and how we we're getting involved with ourselves and each other. And uh, out of the blue, our uh, waitress, a very, very nice lady, with, we always liked her, but found out she was agreeing with us, like you're, the guy's, Maybe that weren't here at the beginning. We were talking about uh, you, know, you do not go against uh, the Jews in Israel and stuff like that because God's demanding that you don't do that. And she's over waiting on somebody else and saying that's exactly right. And pretty soon she comes over and and I think it was uh, I think it was Tom said, "Well, can we pray for you?" She says, "You can pray for my children." And then we found out that uh, she's a pretty uh, faithful gal. And that led to, uh, we we're talking about her dad, who, you know, being disciples, or being a disciple, Gary invited him then to join our group. 
and that's what disciple is. I think it's, it's yeah. not afraid to stand up for her faith, to profess it. You know, you don't have to bash anybody mm -hmm. over the head with it. But then an action speaks louder than words. So we may uh, we may get a new member, I hope. And yeah, that's I, what discipleship I, is. Yeah. Gary's talked about this for a long time. Everyone invites somebody. We all know yeah. someone. Oh, and they yeah. might say no. <laughs> the the thing about joining is, and I we wouldn't have to worry about that with the, with him. I did some research. He's a pastor in North Carolina, and he's a he's well versed. I mean, he'd be great for our group. But anyway, I often tell people. I think I told Tom isn't on right now, but I think I told Tom and anybody, if you don't want to say anything, just get on and listen. And we will We're not going to pick on you. So and then until the day you feel the. And I guarantee you, you will all, I think, agree. You'll come to that day where I say you, you when you feel like you need to speak, you will. And you mm -hmm. do. So mm -hmm. it kind of, God moves you when it's time. It's true. So, so discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are per perverse, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways. Who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perversiveness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are de uh, devious in their ways. Now, I, I want to say to you, and I know most of you are of the age in this group, maybe Tom's not on right now, but uh, you've seen a lot of, of degradation. I'm to... still here. Oh, I don't see it. Dead phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I. I... All right. I shut off my video. All, All right. right. I, okay. I have to push a button to, to speak every time. Okay. Well, what, what I'm getting at here is the degradation of the world that we have lived in from the beginning to where we're at right now. Now, I'm only going to speak probably uh, maybe a little bit. One thing I know that changed the world was television. Now, I know there's many more technology things than that. But if you think about it, uh, everything on TV was censored completely. You never heard any yeah. bad words or any mm -hmm. people kissing or hugging or in bed or having sex or any of those things. But we have transgressed to those points today. Did some research there too. Uh, today, in uh, this was done by Gallup, that on TV today, in one year, you have an opportunity to see people having sex 9,200 times each year. Mm. on tv days yeah. mm -hmm. not only that 81 percent of those people having sex on tv are not married how many percent are gay then <laughs> yeah we're starting to see that too and yeah. thirty-three thousand people a day in america are diagnosed with stds yeah. We're, you know, we are, we've gone so far away from, you know, where we should be here. But uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to point that out to you that, you know, uh, we are gradually moving down the road. When we said last night, you can't reject Israel. Well, we're kind of in some ways rejecting Israel anyway. Yep. Oh. Yeah. All right. So we read this with any understanding of wisdom, fear the Lord and bring peace to you. This is Solomon's approach to offering wisdom, how fear, how to fear the Lord, descriptive words and verbs. And we, we could, we talked about that kind of already, but uh, we know what it, what it means to fear the Lord. All right, next. Yeah. Counseling the son, the Solomon looks to God and wisdom for sharing. These are the things we need to know about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are not one of the same, but they are they, they, they are God. So what there are three avenues there, and we want to put that in there, and he is approaching that through Proverbs and the Commandments. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman and from the wayward woman with her seductive words. Who has left the partner of your youth and ignored the covenant she made before God? Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus, 
You will walk in the ways of good and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. Again, <clears throat> the forbidden woman, we've talked about the sex and, and all that. Again, though, I want to say, thank God, Jesus Christ came to this earth. Yeah. Because yeah. I tell you what, nobody be knocking on that door of heaven if that wouldn't happen. We do all have the opportunity for to repent mm -hmm. and religiously join Jesus Christ in the walk to heaven. But when you read this at Solomon's time, I mean, this is the way you were you were definitely supposed to live. And if you didn't, you were in trouble. Walk in the way of the good, verse 20. If we go back, thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. So the expectation is what it just says. You, you got to be, you got to follow the rules. Life is the path of the righteous. So you got to be righteous for and so plus contrast. So, if, you know, when you say for your, your, when you we are righteous, it's for yourself to be righteous with God. So in the end, you have a great outcome. Plus, there's a contrast of what, you know, if you don't do that. And what happens to the wicked? Not good things. Good. So I threw these in here. Uh, the overarching theme of Proverbs chapter 2 is the relationship between virtue and discernment. So we're th we really should be thinking about these things and, and thinking about the paths that we take and who we affect. And as Mar was talking about this, <clears throat> what opened the door for me was with the waitress was a lot of things Mar said, but I drove home thinking, you know, we're spreading the word of God to everybody right. sitting around us. Yep. Because mm -hmm. yep. we really don't know how many people are listening to us, but yet they are. Yep. And no matter mm -hmm. what, they're going to be thinking about God one way or another, but they are going to be <laughs> thinking about God. Yep. So being public and doing that, because, you know, I was honestly, I was kind of shocked and surprised that, because she wasn't at our table, by the way, guys, when she said that. She was mm -hmm. away yeah. from us. I heard her from across the the, uh, the way in the restaurant said, you're right, because what I'd said, those that yep. reject Israel will pay a big price for it. And she said, you're right. And she walked mm -hmm. over to the table. Yeah. I went, wow. <laughs> yeah, she was over washing the table. And it was it was funny when she said you're right. And then she said her pastor taught him taught on that and her pastor was her father, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, that you guys really remember cool. a few weeks ago we were talking and there was a a, a dad and his kids sitting at the mm -hmm. table not too far from it. And oh, yeah. uh, he got up, came over, introduced himself, and talked a little bit about his children and everything else. And that he was listening to us as well. I thought that was pretty slick. Oh, and there's that one family that was listening to us the other day too. Yeah, they were sitting yeah. there, and there was they had a bunch of kids, and and uh, they they were more. I think they were more curious than they were, but they they you know believed in God. That's for sure. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's great. Well, I told Marv last night. I noticed one thing too as we were talking. There was a lady in a booth smiling at him all the time. So. <laughs> well, well, yeah. what did you expect? I mean, yeah, yeah. That, no, what it was, she said, that is one funny looking guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a chick magnet, guys. He's a chick yeah, magnet. Right. Yeah, I yeah. said I brought it up to Marv. I said, you know, the lady over there, she keeps smiling at you. <laughs> uh, I reminded her of her day. The father speaks to his son. Yeah. Describes how to acquire wisdom, the benefits of one can expect from such a pursuit, and how wisdom protects one from temptations of both wicked man and forbidden woman. It has ends by contrasting the fate of the righteous with the fate of the wicked. So it's very clear and 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 black and white for us on what it happens if you're good and what it, what's the fate if you're not. Uh, again, 
the strength of this in Proverbs is saying, okay, this is where we're at. We don't have a Messiah. We don't have any to, to turn to uh, and sacrifice. By, and that's why you started seeing the sacrificial lambs and the sacrifices of, you know, Baal had, you know, sacrifices of children. And uh, it, was, it was a mess, really. Applying the knowledge wisely requires deliberate effort, making your ear attentive and inclining to your inclining your, your heart. Those who purposely pursue virtuous living by seeking wisdom and understanding develop the quality of discernment. That's as true as it was then as it is true now. We have to think about it and, and make that choice. Proverbs 2 begins by telling us how we will find wisdom by believing God's word, applying it and pursuing it. It's not enough to simply hear the word. We must apply it. We must also desire the word and ask for wisdom. These actions will lead us to knowledge of God. What offers? <laughs> Comments? Kind of interesting. Oh, you were talking about the sacrificial lamb, um, and this is kind of a whole different area. But it talks about. I never thought about this, and I was listening last night talking about abortion and how in the future it's going to look at sacrificing people. Yeah. And you, we would condemn sacrificing people many years ago, and yet that's happening by the millions in this country and around the world. Um, <clears throat> that's in essence what what's being done. Exactly. I think one thing you know, overall that uh, it made it so clear for me is the fact that God loves His children. Yeah. And to to abort a child. <clears throat> you're aborting one of God's children. Yeah. And so my answer when some people say, well, you know, you know, you can get all into, you know, my freedom, my right, my this, my that, that you can't change the fact that God is in love with his children. And so that is flat out. It's not even the sacrificial is part of it, but it's flat murder. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and, and they're making the, they're making the sacrifice for selfish intent, you know, and it's exactly it's exactly it's just the craziest thing is we've gotten that numb. I mean, even before salvation and and probably after salvation, I didn't really have a problem with abortion, which was crazy until, you know, I don't know. I don't how what, what at what point I was just disgusted by and 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 I think even being secular or not being saved or whatever you want to say, I did look at abortion in a bad light as if it was an ignorant choice, because if you don't want to have a baby, you shouldn't have sex. You know, there's a consequence to sex, but, um, and everybody should know that it's pretty simple. You know, I mean, my 10 year old son understands that how babies are made to a degree. Yeah. Uh, Cause I'd rather have him have the understanding through a, a proper way than the perverted way that you know 10 year olds learn about these things in the yeah. alley yeah they want to go have the baby too you know instead of having abortion just go up for adoption then you know. yeah well yeah for mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. but it I, I just to listen to somebody support abortion is the craziest thing to listen to i mean it's like okay you got all the rights in the world you know but I think so, that's the whole thing, and this is what the, I would say, title. certain parts of society are doing things and saying things and even changing the words to things mm -hmm. that make it palatable. And if we accept it, then we're starting to move towards all of that. So mm -hmm. they make it, oh, it's women's rights or it's a medical procedure. Mm -hmm. Same with transgenderism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're, you know, especially on kids, uh, I mean, oh. when they're, those yeah, they, they, I mean, that's they title like a lot everything to, years ago. <laughs> they title yeah. everything to sound exactly the opposite of what it is. You know, they take well, it, take transgender mm -hmm. and they make that to be, you know, gender affirming care. Like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, and they say, yeah, when they say we can do anything we want, we're a body, and really, they're, they're they don't own their body the way God does. They're temporal lords, so they don't own their body in the first place. God does. So. 
What do they call? What do they call that? They call it medical something for women. Uh, gosh, dang it! I think it's like reproductive, reproductive right. rights reproductive or rights. something. Yeah, yeah it's like what? which is what? the opposite. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's like everything's upside down world now. The, the the term that comes to mind is reproductive health. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's that's, right. that's an that's an oxymoron. Like yeah. jumbo jumbo shrimp. I mean, oh yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. just a, an example of how far society has left the faith, left God. Well, you know, always just comes back. Always comes back to me is God knew you before you were born. Yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah. And the, the difficult part is there's a lot of Christians that support all that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. The freedom and, of choice. Uh, it's, it's, like... it's hard to believe. It's just uh, mm -hmm. the education of of even Christian faith is is <clears throat> it's not you guys have expressed you yourselves though so wisely and when i mean that i really do mean that because when we talk about the book of proverbs and we talk about just those things that we've just discussed that your wisdom shines in this area where other people has if they read the book of proverbs would understand that really what they're they're promoting is being wicked not yeah exactly being positive. and so you know i, I i've just been listening to you and I've been thinking, boy, what you've just done is you defined our entire lesson today is that you're standing up, you have the wisdom, you have the understanding, and now it is our job for God, as, as our Father, is to communicate that. Now, that's the part we fall down on sometimes. It's oh. easy to, for us to talk about this amongst us here. It is not so easy to try to communicate it to somebody it's not being wise. That they don't right. have an understanding. And you know, so if they're they not it. a Christian, that's the other part of it. Some of these people will tell you, well, you know, I'm an atheist. I, I don't believe in your God. Well, and they'll come you know, at it from an angle of like superior knowledge and just like as if they're very smart and they'll bring in a lot of intelligent things, but it's just trying to support something through argument that is 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 you know it's it's just like trying to 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 defend the guilty you know yeah. oh yeah i can as an attorney you can come in with a whole lot of knowledge and defend a guilty person and, yeah. and try and get them off but at the same time you know we understand it you know yeah it's 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 easy through wisdom to to look at it and say oh <laughs> That is uh, my, my defense, I just I just told you, Tom, and you know that works for people that believe in God. I mean, if I say, look, God loves his children. So if you kill one of his children, he's not going to be happy about it because he loves his children. Well, somebody that looks back and says, Well, I'm not a Christian and I don't believe in your God, my whole defense goes down the tube because they don't they don't have that end. Now I Absolutely. do believe I do believe, and we and we all have a chance. We've seen it with the guys we work with that come in that door. That's uh, literally will say right to your face, "I don't believe in God." But before they walk out, at the end of the day, somehow God has intervened into their life. Yeah, I know one timer. One time, Ernie Chamber sees the atheists and stuff. You know, don't believe in God yet. One day, he says, "I'm going to sue God." Is you going to sue somebody who don't even believe in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was funny when he did that lawsuit. That was back in the 90s, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, he just was making the point that you can actually sue anybody. All right, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Basically, you know, we have prayers for members and prayers for our prayer lists and have things, but uh, uh, anybody have any prayers for anybody that you want to point out specifically? You know, I want to pray for my mom. You know, I said I had to talk for a while because she had dementia. And I called her on um, Easter. Happy, um, Easter, she didn't get the phone. My sister was there. She said, I call you out. So she called me back and asked how she's doing. And she told me 
and I talked my mom a little bit. She can't hardly hear me, but I guess that she said she had a, her legs really looks bad and snore and stuff, everything. And she, I guess my niece in there, she sent a picture to my daughter. My daughter used to work at Marquis Place at one time, and she did some nursing thing, and she said that's an affection and uh, spreading and stuff, and that's not good. You know, it's like it's a fresh, yeah. you know, eating affection. You know, mm. so and you know, and I wish my brother would take her. To, she both had a dart appointment today, and my sister told Taylor yesterday in the emergency room, but he did take me. I guess called last night. My sister called him last night. He got a little bit mad, upset, or anything. I guess he's upset right now, but he thinks he could take care of all the time. He still had appointment day, so I'm not supposed to come out. But I read somewhere you could sometimes you could, you could have to tape your leg, but over that, my sister daughter said that too. But she said they will do a hundred year old woman. Oh, she'd be ninety eight, not hundred, but still, they probably went here. I think you probably die from that surgery at that age. Yeah, yeah. Really. So that's, <clears throat> I'm well, just sorry about my mom that way. Yeah. I just got something re really quick, guys. I won't extend this out, but I uh, request prayers for my great granddaughters. Um, I don't want to get into the gory details, but her father. Um, is giving his oldest daughter, my great granddaughter. She's 13, and he's supplying her with marijuana because he doesn't want him want her to find it on the street because it might have fentanyl in it. Mm. So that's wow. an amazing thing to me. Okay. Wow. I want to. I want to just throw in a request first for my dad's salvation and his walk in that. You know, I think a lot of couple of us have seen. He's starting to um, tiptoe into salvation and and reading the word and oh. having a lot of a lot of revelation happening there. So just praying for that to really ignite to you know <laughs> fall in love with God tremendously. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, and I would say you know Tom, Tom, I was so pleased to see him there last night, and you know from the first night. I I met him to, and it's kind of what I was saying to you about people, and I don't, I'm not pointing at him that he didn't believe in God, but he is, he's really, God's getting a hold of him, and he's talking when we're sitting around the table last night, he's smiling, he's, he's I mean, he's becoming part of our group of oh, yeah. disciples, and yeah. uh, it's very, it's just heartwarming to see that happen. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's it's an experience, and then it, it. My dad and I don't have a much of a relationship except for when I was young, and it, you know it ebbs and flows. But it's it's really wild how much is like coming back around, and I think we're being able to lay things on the table and walk through those things together as a father and a son, and that's that's incredible. And I know the only way that it's going to happen is through salvation and his heart bent towards God. I mean, he's got to be pursuing God for us to really navigate those waters as a father and a son that I'm, you know, really happy for, I'm happy for you i'm happy for him yeah. and we're fortunate to be part of get getting to see it so that's yeah, I will yeah. Tell you. yeah. awesome uh, i i also right. want to just brad i just want to pray for my friend tom he's a head of uh, fighting with a bout of cancer and i just uh pray that uh, treatments and everything go well for him down the stretch is tom so that's all I have. Would he be able to join us, Mikey? On uh, a, no, I don't think so. But you know, that's a that's a good question. It's possible that I could attempt that. But uh, yeah, that's. A good I think idea. he'd get a lot out of this group. I may pursue that. Okay. <laughs> good. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Thank you. you know, just for all of you guys, I'm really yeah. feeling the the. Uh, I don't want to say pressure. That's not a good word, but I'm feeling the drive. Uh, that we need to make this group grow. We, you know, our discussions are really, really good, and they are mm -hmm. what could change people's lives. And for us not to share mm -hmm. them with other people is not good. And I think mm -hmm. what Jesus asked us to do was to go out and make this. You know, we're going to make disciples of other people. Uh, right. We've done a really good job for the last few years of taking care of our lives. You guys are all strong. You do a really good job. It's now time to share your strength. So. Yeah. Uh, Let's try to, add, that's why <clears throat> I'm going to try to, this guy's already a pastor, but I think he'll benefit by being in our group. One reason is because, you know, he is a, he's a black pastor that would just benefit from being in this group. I just know that that's what it's saying to my heart. 
So I'm going to try to get him in here if I can. Yeah. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get to him personally to see what he has to say and it may work. It may not, but at least we tried. Yep, so okay. same on your end, you, you meet with people all week long and once in a while, those are the people you say, Ugh, <laughs> I don't know. Those are the people you need to get involved. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, okay. I've got a little prayer I want to read today. And so I'm going to put it on here. Okay. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, please, please, please hear us when we bring these people to you and ask for their, their, their healing and, and their, their, their beginning to understand who you are and, and make their families understand. And, make, uh, you know, we have more of an understanding and a wisdom of what lies ahead, both here on earth and then in heaven also. With this wisdom, we pray that we may be with you and and um, no matter what we will have no tears no sorrow no suffering and that is yet to come but we pray for those that need to be healed today here and we put it in your hands i, I want to thank you for the hope that jesus has overcome the world and now uh, we have, want help to overcome what we are facing every day thank you for the grace that you know, we don't have to do it perfectly. I just have to make progress and I have, and we love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, hey. Gary. You guys have a good week. Yeah. Everybody have a good, have a good one. Everybody have a good Bye. week. Bye. 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 Bye.